How's everybody doing? Um, my name is Dr. Tidwell. You call me just Dr. T if you like, that's fine. Um, of course, I am teaching you guys with Ms. Garrity for U.S. History right now for this semester. It's my first year at Willer. I came from Pelbrook, where I taught for the last three years. I've always employed a flip classroom, so like doing videos like this is something I've always done. I'm just kind of making them fluff up, if you will, a little bit better. So us doing this distance learning is going to be fun. Um, these videos are really meant to help enhance what we're doing in the classroom, the virtual classroom. Um, you have fill-in notes that you guys can use that I'll be going with as far as helping you fill these in. But this is where you get all the core information. If you have any kind of course concerns, make sure you ask either myself or Ms. Garrity. Ms. Garrity, go ahead and introduce yourself, talk to our students, and we'll get started. Hello, welcome to U.S. History. Um, excited for this semester, even though it's going to be a little different uh, than maybe what we were expecting. It's still going to be a great, uh, a great semester. Um, Dr. Tidwell and I are committed to making you guys uh, successful, helping you guys um, learn a ton this semester, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, this is my fourth year at Wheeler, and this is my third year in U.S. history. It's one of my co uh, favorite courses uh, here at Wheeler, so I'm excited. Okay, so this video here, we're gonna really try to maybe pace you through a little bit slower than we do in other videos. But as the semester goes on, you start seeing this pace speed up because we'd be expecting you to understand how to use these videos. So um, pay attention. Remember, this is a video, so you can always pause it. Um, you can fast forward it to wherever you feel is needed. Um, the words that even though I may be going at a pretty good cl clip, so as um, Miss Garrity, you can still pause at any time. So don't ever feel like you just gotta keep going like we're in class or something, okay? All right, so the first thing we wanna do is give you some background. This is more so a review of concepts you should've gotten in world history, but we just wanna make sure you're clear. That way it makes more sense when we start getting into colonial America. The focus today is gonna to be all colonial America as far as the development. We'll talk about all 13 colonies, all right? All right, so here's some background. You go ahead and take a second. You can pause the video now to read through this if you would like. This is something that we'll be doing a lot. Some things we do want you to read. Um, one thing you're gonna notice with the fill-in notes is that it's not gonna be fill in the blank. You're gonna have to do some reading and some analysis to actually understand how to fill these notes, all right? So it's a little bit more of a challenge because nothing should be easy because life is not easy, but it's something that you can really benefit you as far as if you do these notes and you actually understand it. Let me take a second to say this too. It's one thing just to do work to be doing it. It's another thing to do the work to understand it. Um, my grading policies is gonna be very simple. Yes, I'm gonna collect some schoolwork, but I'm more so gonna see if you did it. I'm gonna see if you understand the material based on the assessments. So let me reiterate, do not do work in this class just for the sake of saying, hey, I did the work, I should pass. No, you gotta do the work and actually study it. You actually gotta ask questions. You gotta apply it. I'm gonna give you multiple times to apply that knowledge, okay? All right, so, so we, uh, Renaissance changes in Europe. Remember, we talked about the, the, all the um, colonies were always founded by European nations, be it Spain, Portugal, um, or England. This is just some of the reasons why they actually um, did it. So you can always pause this at any time. We're about to get into more detailed information. All right, so you had the explorers coming to the colonies. So why did they come to the colonies, into America specifically? I want to focus on the three G's because these are the ones you got to know. So this may not be in the filling notes. I also just may put this at the top so you don't forget it because it's going to be important to know. The first one is going to be gold, the desire for wealth. They wanted to have money. Like just as it is now, people go to college, go to school just to go get a degree because they think they're going to make a lot of money. That don't necessarily mean they will, but they hope to. God, the idea of white man's burden. What white man's burden is, is this ideal that um, Europeans had the burden in their heart to make sure they spread Christianity across the world. This is really um, part of coming out of the Renaissance, the spread of human, uh, not humanity, but spread of Christianity throughout humanity, and that was a burden to them. So they really feel like it was their duty to spread uh, Christianity. In other words, if you was a Christian, some cultures would consider you to be a heathen, and therefore we have to make sure we civilize you. The last one was glory. Well, be the first one to explore it. We'll be the first one to um, see it. Christopher Columbus is often credited for uh, discovering America, and that's why he's. That's why we have Columbus Day. Uh, there's a lot more coming in history now, as far as we're looking back at it. And you know, there's people other others that came well before Columbus, including even the Egyptians. If you look at, um, they came before Columbus, written by Ivan van Sertima. Talk about that book later on. But there are different arguments. So keep remember. Sorry, remember your three G's: God, gold, and glory. Okay. Ms. Gary, you want to go ahead and pick up some of the motives? Sure, thank you. Um, 
And again, uh, to follow up on uh, what Dr. Tidwell started, um, the the things that existed that enabled this um, this travel and this exploration and this settling of of the new world were uh, better technology, um, faster trade routes. Um, the, the travel that uh, wasn't possible before was possible now. And so people were taking advantage of that. Um, also, there was uh, this pent up desire in uh, Europe for new products. Um, they wanted more trade with Asia. They wanted more products uh, from Asia. And so they thought by traveling um, by sea eastward, um, that, would get them, that would get them to those Asian um, markets faster. Uh, and uh, gunpowder, um, Europeans uh, through their tra trade with China uh, got gunpowder. We know that uh, the Chinese invented that, but uh, the Europeans uh, had it in spades and were able to leverage that and, um, and use that to uh, enable their, their world exploration. Um, and then um, as Dr. Tidwell said, the white man's burden, um, there was this desire to bring uh, the Christian faith uh, to these new, new parts of the world. Uh, we saw this in the Crusades. So this was uh, carried on with the, um, with the travel and exploration of the new lands as well, um, spreading of Christianity. All right, thank you. So not to start in your notes yet, we just give you background. Uh, so some of the effects you had Native American civilizations being destroyed. I want to really focus down here. I hope you can see my cursor with this idea of the very last bullet that says cultural exchange occurred, also known as culture diffusion. What well, culture diffusion is anytime you have a mixing of cultures. So if you look at the United States, it's a great example of having culture diffusion where you have everybody mixing together. Uh, here in America, we can go buy both um, Mexican food, we can buy Cuban food, you can buy soul food, you can buy um, Japanese food, you can buy Chinese food. That is the definition of culture uh, diffusion. But also the issue with that, you also mix diseases too. Um, you look at right now, we're in COVID-19. COVID-19, as with every other uh, disease, travels because we're in a global economy. Every, nothing stays in one area. Um, so it travels across the world, no matter where it originates. In 1918, you had what's called the Spanish flu. Even though it did not start in Spain, it's called the Spanish flu because they're the first one to really get out to um, report it. And that's give you some background history. We'll talk about that later in the class. Um, but diseases always spread across. So you can call this maybe the Asia Exploration Flu because thousands of both Europeans and Native Americans, millions of both Europeans and Native Americans were killed because they were mixing different um, diseases. If you ever go outside of the country, you're going to have to get yourself um, shots because you don't have immunity to some things you may have in other areas. That includes even going to places like Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is not another country, but it's a totally different climate. So you have to be aware of that. Um, the European powers built stiffen overseas empires. This is when you had empires starting to really grow, if you may recall from uh, world history. You also had a demand in slaves due to the Carib uh, Caribbean exchange. So because of the slave trade and trades going on, you had a need to have more slaves to be able to cultivate lands. Earlier in history, you already had Europeans that was going to Africa, trading with them and learning from them. So they already understood individuals that had a very good um, skill set as far as how they can grow things. So they brought them over here. Not every African slave was stolen. I got to make sure I say that. Some were, st um, some and most were actually sold because of wars and things of that nature too. And you also got to remember in Africa, slavery was a lot different than what we saw happening in the new world. So whereas that you as a slave, you, you literally had to be a quote unquote slave because you lost a war. And at the end of this, um, your time, like an indigenous servitude, if you will, you'll be free. So you sold a slave thinking it's not going to be that big of a deal. I cannot argue, nor can I say or against that the Africans that sold slaves knew what they were selling them into, particularly in the beginning of this process. But also capitalism really expanded the growth of trade because now everybody wants to make money and people want to trade more. All right, you want to talk about imperialism, Ms. Gary? Yeah, and this kind of ties in with the last G, uh, the G that stands for glory. Um, in an imperial um, system, you have um, the head of state is like a king or a queen. Um, and so they're, they're an autocrat, they're, they're in charge of everything. Um, and in that kind of system, the, the king, the queen, the crown um, is is in charge of everything, um, head of church, um, you know, politics, 
you know, social, everything is under the control of the, the crown. Now, when you've got a king, you've got, you know, kings of Portugal, Spain, um, England, they're, they all want to be the biggest, the biggest guy on the block. They want to be, you know, head person in charge. So there was this, um, it kind of fueled that, that desire to get to the new lands first, settle the new, uh, the new land first and get to the, get to the good stuff first. So um, that's why you see like Columbus, who was an Italian, um, he sailed for Spain because Spain was like, dude, you know, I want you on my team and I want you, um, you know, getting over there and, and beating everybody else. <laughs> that's facts. And imperialism will come back up again. So make sure you have that key on uh, root word. All right, so now yeah, if you think about, sorry, Dr. Tedwell, if you think about the word empire, empire, imperial, it's, they come from the same root. So if you think of imperialism, you think of empire, oh yeah, okay. Then you, you, you see these countries want to spread. They want to spread their tentacles to other parts of the world. That's right. And just keep that in mind also, just as you guys are thinking about SATs, ACTs, root words, just in general, that's how I got better vocabulary. All right, so um, this is just another, it's just a quick synopsis of all the causes. I do want to talk about uh, social Darwinism real quick, the idea of survival of the fittest. So whoever is the strongest will be able to survive, and whoever is the weakest won't. So that was really some of the push if you look into some of the social perspectives of why they was doing imperial, not imperialism, but also just spread across the world. But mostly, it was money. They needed that money, they wanted that power, they wanted that status. All right, so now let's get into your notes. So you take out your notes, and we'll kind of walk you through this first process, okay? We're going to talk about the 13 colonies. As you guys can see here, it says notes start here. So now this is when you actually start scribing your notes. Um, you never know. This might be extra credit. Again, this is on-demand video lecture. This is something to help enhance what we're going to be doing in the classroom through the nearpods, activities, and vocabulary. This is core material. This is how you get ready for the assessments, all right? As of right now, we are having a end-of-course state exam. So this is another way to really... Make sure you drill this in. So you show these to Ms. Garrity and I. Who knows? You never know what's going to happen. Might get some extra points. You borderline. Oh, yeah. You know what? I remember he always did these notes. Let's help him out a little bit. You don't know. All right. So this is a good uh, just geography lesson. because so you know you got to take geography back in ninth grade, I think it was. All right. So just make sure you guys see the good, quick way to really understand the 13 colonies. If you look at the United States. All the states on the East Coast, those are 13 colonies. That was the foundation of the United States. All right, so now let's talk about the notes, talk about how you fill this out. So you notice you got the blank colony. The first will be royal colony. Belong to the, yep, that's right, the crown. Blank colony, what's the blank? Proprietary, that's right. Belong to powerful people and companies. And then you have the next ones will be the last will be what? That's right, joint stock co colony. Started as a, that's right, business venture to try to and make money. So keep this in mind because every colony is going to fall into one of these three categories. Either it's going to be a royal colony, proprietary colony, or a joint stock colony, and they're going to exchange constantly. Well, now what I'll do is give you a couple seconds, so you can always pause the video, to look at all the 13 colonies. So you have the New England colonies, middle colonies, and southern colonies. What I always do when I'm talking about the colonies, these are your notes that you make them the way you feel comfortable, where you study. I never wrote the whole colony. I wrote abbreviations. For example, New England, I have NH, Mass, Con, and Rhode Island, which stands for New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island. For middle colonies, I have NY, NJ, PA, and Delaware. For New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware. And then for the southern colonies, I have NC, SC, GA, VA, and um, MA. Might be wrong with that MA. I get those confused sometimes, but you know that. Well, yeah, the postal the postal abbreviation is MD. Okay, so MD. And that's what I usually I usually do like the post. Unlike you, Doctor Tidwell, I'm about writing stuff real like abbreviated, mm -hmm. and so, like the postal abbreviations when I do this the colonies and this, and later the, the states. So now we got those. So now me my correction. Okay. All right. Let's keep rolling. Again, pause as you feel is needed, because we're about to speed up now. Unless my computer wants to speed up. <laughs> All right, you want to go ahead and get started with Jamestown, Ms. Garrity? 
Sure, sure. Um, Jamestown, it wasn't the first uh, colony, but it was the first permanent colony um, in the New World, um, uh, in, the, in North America. And it was established by uh, the Virginia Company. So you can tell by the name that they were about business, it was company. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, um, they were set settling Virginia because they were looking for, they were looking for gold. So the, the Spanish had found a lot of gold in the New World, but of course they weren't, they weren't in Virginia. Got news for you, don't go to Virginia looking for gold, there's no gold. <laughs> and, they didn't, and they didn't find any either. So, yikes, what do you do, right? Um, they only had 144 settlers. Um, they settled on the James River, and you'll see this um, as we uh, continue to study. There's going to be a lot of settling on waterways, um, very important for transportation. Um, they didn't bring any women, and they only brought, uh, out of those 144 uh, settlers, only four of them were carpenters. So now you got to picture they're coming to nothing. There's nothing, there's no structures, there's no, it's not like moving to the next town. There's nothing, there's nothing there. They're starting from scratch and that's all, that's all they had. Um, and then they didn't find gold. So, um, so they were kind of, uh, they were kind of down now, even before they got started. And remember, water is very important. Water is, fresh water is one of the resources that we don't have a lot of. So you typically want to be around a river because it's more of a, a fresh water source. It also helps with protection for the military, helps with building. And you think about Atlanta. Atlanta, we, hey, we get a lot of water. We've been in a lot of water, a lot of rain lately. But if you remember a couple years ago, we was a drought. And we was all, it's always a fight between us and Tennessee about that little fresh water areas right on the border. Same thing even with Florida. It's always a consistent fight. Go Google it. But fresh water is always important. The thing about Egypt, the Nile River, that's all I got to say. That's world history. I better know that one. All right, so some of the hardships you had in um, um, Jamestown is that you didn't have disease as far as malaria. malaria. Um, not used to hard work. So a lot of these individuals that came over to Europe, they wasn't used to this hard work. More importantly, the climate is different. Majority of all of Europe is in the same climate as New York. It's a lot colder, and, it's not, and the, the summers are not as long. Whereas in Virginia, it's very low and harsh summers. So they had a lot of diseases, not used to the hard work, starvation, um, very dependent on supplies from Great Britain and natives. So anytime you guys see GB in my notes, that stands for Great Britain. Remember, abbreviations is always faster. The first year, only 38 survivors after 800 more came only 60 survived. So this was starving time of winter because the winter is also pretty harsh up there in Virginia. So you get a very harsh summer, which is longer, but in that short winter, it can be bad. Like they can get feet and foot feet of snow up there. All right, so what did they eat? Well, they ate what they had. Rats, mice, sometimes even each other, cannibalism. So when things get hard, it gets hard. If you follow along your notes, you're on 3E right now, okay? So important people. You had John um, Smith, who was initial leader, loved by Pocahontas. Then you had John Rolfe, who brought tobacco illegally, which established slavery. So take a second. You might make a side note in your notes for him. Without John Rolfe, without, without him getting this um, tobacco illegally, this colony would have failed. Okay? The Spanish and Portuguese had a chokehold on tobacco. Everybody in Europe wanted tobacco. Yes, I'm not talking about weed. I'm talking about tobacco, like cigarettes. And I'm talking about the clean tobacco, not the, the lace tobacco. But everybody wanted this product because you cannot grow it in Europe. So John Rowe actually sneaked into a uh, Spanish plantation down in the West Indies, also known as the Caribbean, brought a leaf up. That's all you need is one leaf. Brought it back to Virginia and started planting it. And then that's when Virginia started to rock. Okay? So if you want to talk about the success and also the reason why we're over here right now in the United States, we got to go back and get John Rowe uh, credit. We got a lot of presents on um, bills. John Rolfe, probably one of the most important people in our history. I can make the argument. Uh, but then you have also had um, Pocahontas, who married Rolfe and was a daughter of Pohatan, and this really helped a lot with Native relations. So in other words, I'm telling y'all, don't forget about John Rolfe. So we turn to page two on your notes if you're following along with me. All right, so Jamestown is definitely in trouble at this point. You want to go ahead and get to this, uh, Ms. Garrity? 
Yeah, yeah. So um, as we said earlier, no gold. So they make the pivot to growing tobacco and um, the, um, you know, the topography and the climate is perfect for tobacco growing um, in Virginia. Now you want to do this on a, you want to scale this up, right? You want to grow a lot of it. So you're going to need manpower, right? So indentured servants, um, slavery, okay. Um, we're, you're going to start seeing this um, kind of ramp up. Uh, the Virginia Company goes into debt. Um, so England revokes uh, their charter and uh, Virginia becomes a royal colony. Uh, so the king appoints a governor, uh, Sir William Berkeley, and he wasn't so hot at his job. Um, he Not at all. <laughs> he tax poor, and he pays the price, uh, uh, tax poor planners uh, more than the wealthy. And that's, uh, that's never a good idea. Um, so we're going to see on the next slide um, information about Nathaniel uh, Bacon. Um, and he's one of, these, one of these kind of regular, you know, farmers. And he gets everybody, organizes everybody um, to launch a rebellion. Um, they burn Jamestown to the ground, and um, they achieved their they achieved their goals. They got they got the attention, they got notice. And that's really it right there. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. I mean that's what rebellions are for, right? You got you know if you don't want to pay attention, then you're gonna you're gonna see rebellion. So Berkeley was again appointed governor. Uh, he taxes poor planters, and then he had a lot of issues with Indians. Nathaniel Bacon raises an army in 1676 to lead a fight against the poor. Bacon wins, and Jamestown is burned to the ground, as Ms. Garrity says seconds ago. One month, one, only one month later, though, Bacon is then um, died, and a new governor is appointed. So Bacon's rebellion did not last very long, but the significance is crazy. So make sure you can make a side note of this. Wealthy equals planters. Poor equals landless. So just as it is, quick economics lesson. If you want to become powerful in this country, buy land. Not rent, but buy land. Own some land. Because even if it's your house, whatever, not a car, own land. Because that's how you accumulate wealth. And this is dating back to colonial America. Again, the people that have the power, the people that are wealthy are the planters. Those people own land. Whereas the poor was the landless people that work the land. It's two different people. Okay? You're welcome. You can give me some uh, commission about that 10% in about five years on that uh, economical advice. Um, <laughs> So the significance of the war, it shows a sharp class difference between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, first example of colonial resistance. It also foreshadows um, issues over land between both the Indians and also Native Americans. So that's some of the significance of Bacon's Rebellion, but just kind of some background. Now some other cool stuff about Virginia. Let's first watch this video. <laughs> This video here is just a quick synopsis of Jamestown. Um, it's a two minute part from what the whole video you guys be watching American Story of Us. Actually, you guys gonna be assigned American Story of Us, so just watch that part of the video, you get this. But this is just quickly talking about Jamestown. If you wanna go back and look at the present yourself, you can. I'm gonna go ahead and move on because you guys are actually gonna be assigned the whole American Story of Us where you gotta watch the whole video, including the part about Jamestown. So let's have some fun, okay, before we get into some other cool stuff. We're going to do some historical tweets, all right? This is extra credit, okay? This is going to be due the day of your uni exam. You have to go look at the calendar. The calendar is on drtidwell3.com. You scroll down to where you have U.S. history. You may be able to see the calendar of where everything is happening. This will be due the day of the uni exam before you take the uni exam, all right? What you got to do is construct a tweet. One tweet, 140 characters, and you got to create three hashtags using these four, one of these, three of these four individuals, either John Roth, Pocahontas, Nathaniel Bacon, or Governor Berkeley, all right? So this kind of gets you some practice. And here's a quick video to show you what I'm talking about. Hey, Justin, what's up? Not much, Jimmy. Hashtag chillin'. What's up with you? Been busy working. Hashtag rise and grind. Hashtag is it Friday yet? <laughs> <laughs> hey, check it out. I brought you some cookies. Hashtag homemade. Hashtag oatmeal raisin. Hashtag show me the cookie. <laughs> Sweet. Hashtag don't mind if I don't. 
pretty good. Hashtag get my cookie on. Hashtag I'm the real cookie monster. Hashtag no, 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 no. Delicious, right? Yeah. Hashtag I did it all for the cookie. Hashtag LOL, 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 Hashtag classic. By the way, did you catch last week's episode of Duck Dynasty? Hashtag quack, quack. Nah, lately I've mostly been watching Netflix. Hashtag Orange is the New Black. Oh, nice. I've been watching a lot of Barney the Dinosaur. Hashtag Purple is the New Black. Hashtag I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. Hashtag I'm 38. Hashtag dinosaurs. Hashtag how do they go extinct? Hashtag meteor. Hashtag Ice Age. Hashtag speaking of Ice Age, I just watched Ice Age on demand the other day. Hashtag funny. Hashtag Ray Romano. Hashtag Debra! Debra! Hey, by the way, Halloween's only like a month away. I know. I mean, do you know where you're gonna be at? Hashtag life decisions, hashtag sexy ghost. I think I'm gonna go as a ninja turtle. Hashtag gotta be Raphael. Hashtag Leonardo sucks. Hashtag the turtle, not the Italian Renaissance painter. Hashtag Mona Lisa. Hashtag, is she smiling? Hashtag, speaking of smiling, I just saw my dentist. Hashtag bling. Hashtag dental care. Hashtag cavity free. Hashtag, that's how we do. Hashtag, we go hard. Hashtag, and we can't stop. Hashtag, we won't stop. Hashtag, we run this. Hashtag, true plays for life. Hashtag, is it worth it? Or let me work. Yeah. Hashtag put my thing down, flip it, then reverse it. Hashtag is your permanent in the gang yet? Hashtag is your permanent in the gang yet? Hey guys. Yeah, Quest? What's up? Hashtag shut the f up. All right, so that's a calm video from something you guys are about to see. There's a reason why I have a waiver for rated R videos. <laughs> so be ready. And that's including music, all right? So we're about to get into some stuff. Heads up, we're gonna be listening. We're gonna be analyzing Kendrick Lamar later on to talk about Civil War. Just get happy, but it's coming. All right, so that's your assignment. Create one hashtag. We use at least three of these individuals. Um, 140 characters. You ready to show that to Miss Gary and I ahead of your first unit exam? And again, I'm not gonna tell you today on this video the unit exam. You have to go look on my website, Dr. Tidwell3, D R T I D W E L L 3.com. Scroll down to where you see the calendar for U.S. history, and you have your test dates. And in fact, get really used to that calendar because it tells you all the materials that we cover daily. All right, so let's get into the House of Burgesses. We're kind of move a little bit quicker. Um, other school stuff, you got the House of Burgesses. It's the first elected representative legislative group, beginning of democracy power, okay? So democracy is, now, let's, let's talk about democracy. Let's go back to now government. Give you some prelude to what you can get in government. Democracy is anytime you can vote, okay? So Ms. Gary and I are recording this right now, August 11th, which is the Georgia primary uh, runoff election day. 100% vote. If you vote, that's who you get to put in the office, okay? I'm not talking about electoral college. We talk about that in the next unit when we get to um, the Constitution. But democracy, as long as people have the right to vote or they can vote, that's a democracy. Now, you have various types of democracies. You have representative democracy, which is what we have. We elect individuals to go and represent us in Washington, D.C., or Atlanta, places that are local um, areas. A direct democracy is that we don't have representatives. We actually directly influence all the decisions that are being made. There are very few direct democracies. However, you may recall that the Greeks had that. We have a representative democracy more so based off the Romans. So those are connections both to world history, US history, government, 5% um, petition fee for next year you passing these EOCs. All right, let's keep going. Now that, um, House of Burgesses eventually becomes the Virginia State Assembly. But again, this is based off of old Roman thoughts. The Roanoke disaster. You were going to talk about this real quick, Ms. Garrity? Sure, sure. Um, Sir Walter uh, Raleigh tried on two occasions to start, um, to start a colony on Roanoke Island, um, which is it's off the coast of, of North Carolina. Um, the first time um, the settlers faced starvation and abandoned the colony and returned to England. Um, the second time, everyone vanished. Um, no one knows. No one knows what happened to um, the Roanoke settlement. Um, you know, we, we don't know if it was uh, Native Americans who came, you know, came in and cleaned them out or, um, or they just left the, left the settlement, went somewhere else. It's just, it's a mystery. They haven't been able to, um, to determine what happened for sure. Okay. So to keep that in the back of your mind, just because that may come up later on, it's definitely good as far as contextualization, being able to con connect things together. That's really good to know. All right, so now let's get into more of the colonies. Let's get really into it. Let's talk about New England. 
But first, here is a crash. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash. If you're watching this on the press, you can go ahead and watch this. Um, also on my website, I have a link to all the crash courses. Or just YouTube, Crash Course US History, number four. This is really good. Um, you guys are going to be assigned the first seven crash courses where you got to do some film portions on it. So you can watch this on your own. Um, not going to spend the time right now. That's 12 minutes. We can get through more material in your notes. All right. So talk about the Plymouth Colony, Massachusetts Bay. This was a joint stock um, colony. Okay. Jamestown established for economic reasons, whereas Plymouth was established by religious separatists, also known as the Puritans. Okay. So again, Jamestown was for money. Plymouth up north was more for religion. The Prigons came on the, guess what, the Mayflower. You've all heard about that going back to um, grade school back in 1620. Um, specifically, the Pilgrims seeking religious freedom from what was going on in England. They signed the Mayflower uh, Compact, first written government document of our nation. Laws made by the majority all would obey them. It's kind of ironic that they came here to the New World seeking religious freedom, but then they became one of the most religiously intolerant of all the colonies that's hit the New World. Um, half the settlers died by the spring. Um, they had a deep faith and determination to help them survive, also known as Thanksgiving, which gave they had a lot of help from the Native Americans at the time period. The leader was William Bathford and became part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Okay. If you did not agree with the, their way of life, they banished you. Okay. Again, they came on the Mayflower in 1620, immediately signed the Mayflower Compact, first written government document of our nation. Um, examples of laws made by majority, and they all had to obey, have died, but the Indians, Native Americans be historically accurate here, helped to grow food, also known as Thanksgiving, and then will eventually lose their charter because of debt and also because of the Salem Witch Trials. So coming up is going to be a video so I'm kind of get more into what the Salem Witch Trials were, just for you to be more clear on it. Uh, just some more background here. Of course, you can always stop the video and just pause. If you want to take notes, you can. You have filling notes as far as key things that I think is important based on the standards, but you always can add to it, which, of course, I would love to see when you guys do these notes. Okay. So let's learn, let's learn a little bit more about the Salem Witch Trials here, what you're doing, trying to find out the who, what, when, and why, excuse me, who, what, when, where, and why, okay? Here you go. In the winter of 1692, a group of eight young girls in Salem, Massachusetts began exhibiting strange behavior, seizures, contortions, trance-like states. Pressured to reveal who had cast spells on them, the girls ended up incriminating many of their neighbors. In a series of trials, hundreds of people were accused of being witches, and 19 were eventually hanged. And ever since, historians have wondered what caused this terrible calamity. Was this a prank that got out of hand? Was this a grudge against angry neighbors? Now, one of the most compelling theories is that this was a rare case of food poisoning. Rye was the staple grain of Salem. And under the right conditions, rye can be infected with a fungus called ergot. Eating ergot is known to lead to violent muscle spasms, delusions, and other symptoms much like the recorded symptoms of the girl. What's more, ergot thrives in warm, damp conditions. Now, the summer of 1691 had been particularly wet. And interestingly, nearly all the girls lived near marshes on the west side of Salem. Now, historians have no way of definitively understanding the causes of the Salem witch hunts. However, the summer of 1692 was a dry one. That summer, the symptoms stopped just as abruptly as they started, and so did the executions. All right, so in a nutshell, y'all look teenagers, y'all listen to music. A lot of these women got killed because they got high off of wheat. There's no way to kind of make that sound better, but that's what it was. But when you look into a society that you have a different cultures mixing with um, Native Americans, and then you also have the idea that you have um, very high religious background, these things are new and it's weird. Oh my God, they must be witches. Because there was a very high belief in witches. Go back and look in world history during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. There's a high probability of understanding that people that act weird like this are witches. So... Make sure you understand that that was one of the major issues, but also kind of gets into some of the questions about 
some of the revivals we're going to hear in a moment because of the Salem Witch Trials. So now you got some other colonies going on too. Ms. Garrett, do you want to go ahead and talk about Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Maine? Sure. Um, so the New England colonies, um, Connecticut. Um, Connecticut was a joint stock company. It was founded by Thomas Hooker. Um, religion wasn't as important um, in the Connecticut colony as it was in the, in the Plymouth colony. And um, Connecticut was the uh, first colony to uh, write a constitution. Uh, New Hampshire and Maine. Um, so Maine was part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony until um, until 18, oh, there it is, 1820. Um, and New Hampshire was founded by John Wheelwright. Um, and he was uh, later expelled from, from the colony. It was a joint stock colony, and then it became royal. So I don't know if you see a pattern, but a lot of the colonies kind of start out as either proprietary or, or joint stock company, uh, colonies, and then they end up being royal colonies. How convenient for the king, right? Um, the king wants these colonies, right? Um, so there's an incentive for the, uh, for the, uh, the king to take these colonies over. Um, yeah, and so that's, uh, and that's New England. Um, and a fun fact, uh, Dr. Tudel, I went to college uh, right near Salem. Really? Um, in Massachusetts, yeah, yeah, cool, cool area, beautiful area, um, but yeah, it was neat to 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 go to school there. What's up? I want to find out something new. All right, you guys. So, any questions so far? Y'all doing all right? Remember, if you need to, you always go back and rewind. You always can pause. You always can do whatever you need to to make sure you feel comfortable with this. This is on demand, meaning you do this based on how you feel. If you want to take a break, go ahead and do that. But we're about halfway through, and then we're going to be knocked out, we'll be done. All right, so let's keep moving on. All right, so you got some other colonies. You got also Rhode Island. It's a joint stock company founded by Roger Williams, banished from Massachusetts because he wanted um, a separation of church and state. He, how he was different from other founders, he actually brought land from the Indians and not just take it. Um, it was complete religious freedom here in Rhode Island, but the key thing here is that it was complete religious freedom. You can practice it as you feel comfortable, but more importantly, he also bought land from the Native Americans that he didn't just simply take it like some others did, okay? Let's go ahead and talk about now the halfway covenant. You want to go do this for us, Ms. Garrity? Sure, sure. Um, so about halfway through the 1600s, um, we're, we're a generation now it, sorry, got my mic covered. Um, uh, halfway through the uh, 1600s, we have, um, we're like a generation into the settlement um, that the Puritans, uh, the colony that the Puritans have established in New England. Um, the, this new young generation seems less committed to religion and more interested in, um, in making money. Um, so, uh, the elder generation crafted this halfway covenant um, and the clergyman wanted, um, wanted people to, to profess um, that, they, that they were of a certain faith. Um, and then, but, but in order to get people, the younger people more interested in like going back to church, uh, they said that people could um, participate without, you know, declaring their, their total belief in, in everything lock, stock, and barrel. So the, the Puritans are trying to kind of make things a little more relaxed so people will come back into the, the younger people will come back into the fold. Right. Okay. All right, let's go to New England Confederation. It's made up of Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and New Haven, uh, formed as a military alliance from the threat of natives, lasted until 1684 when the king ended it. And why? Because they want to have unity against the natives. King Philip's War, okay? King Philip's War is also known as Medicom, was the leader of the, I cannot say this correctly. Can you help me out with this, uh, Ms. Garrity? Oh, Algonquin. What she said, El Gar El El Dang, 
See, you can have a doctor that still that. can't say things right. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here, Doctor Tidwell, because when I trip over something, I'm gonna need a I'm gonna need a phone a friend. We're gonna have to help each other out to this. <laughs> El Guacuan, I tried, okay. The El Guacan people. Um, he united many tribes against the English settlers who were trying to take their land and force them to convert. The war lasted from 1675 to 76. Thousands of people were killed on both sides. The English won, but the but Medicon was killed. Okay, the significance it ended the native resistance in North, excuse me, in New England. Okay. All right, take a second now to look at this chart. I'm going to keep moving. This is a good time to pause. And just look at the difference between the northern, um, excuse me, from the southern New England colonies and middle colonies as far as economy, population, religion, and also relations with natives. Just a quick little idea as far as to get you a visual of that. It might be a good idea to take maybe a screenshot of this and maybe add this to your notes, particularly if you're typing it up. That's what I would do, especially because it's color-coded, to really kind of get you to see the, difference between the, the differences between the colonies. This is what trips up a lot of students on that first coming test. So make sure you guys got this, all right? All right, the middle colonies, all right? So the middle colonies will include, you're right, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware. They're located um, in the middle of the Atlantic coast of North America. It's very diverse, and this is known as the bread basket. Um, they baked a lot of bread. That's, yeah, that's what they did. <laughs> All right. All right, let's talk about New York. Ms. Gary, do you want to go here? Sure. Um, and another fun fact, I, uh, a lot of my ancestors are, are, were Dutch um, settlers who uh, went to New York. Um, okay. Before it, was, before it was called New York, um, the Dutch called it New Amsterdam. And, um, you know, they, they weren't very creative about naming things in the New World. Um, so Amsterdam is uh, the capital city in the Netherlands. And so when they came to the New World, they just said, New Amsterdam. Ooh, look how creative we are. <laughs> um, and they were all about business. Um, it was a joint stock company to, to, to make money. Um, and then later, um, the English uh, took the colony over from the Dutch, and then they, they changed the name. Guess what they changed it to? They changed it to New York. There's York, England, um, and the Duke of York um, was, uh, he was given a fleet by his, his brother was the king uh, to take this colony. And so the colony then um, got the Duke of York's name, uh, New York. Um, and it was, um, it was ethnically diverse. You know, the Dutch um, were, they were really about business. They weren't about uh, necessarily uh, religion and being insular and keeping people out of their group. They were just more about um, making money and um, were kind of like open to, um, to you know, different groups. Um, coming into the colony. So there was a fair amount of, um, of freedom and um, liberal, you know, attitudes in the, you know, as, com as directly compared to say like Plymouth, which was very, you know, homogenous and insular and like strict. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So then you have, next coming will be New Jersey. All right. Um, New Jersey is a Great Britain proprietary, once owned by the Dutch, also owned by the Duke of York. Then comes Delaware, who was started by the Swedes, taken by the Dutch, and then by the English. Also owned by the Duke of York, later purchased by William Penn, who was scared that... As, oh, excuse me, he was scared that Pennsylvania was landlocked, so he, and he lo lose money. So he didn't want to be landlocked. Again, you want to be able to trade over waterways. Speaking of Pennsylvania, it was a proprietary start colony started by William Penn. Also brought land from the Indians. So he also didn't just take the land, he bought it from the Indians. Now, when I say he bought or any of these individuals bought the land is that I'm not saying they bought it for a good price. I'm just saying they bought it, right? Um, found it as a sanctuary for the Quakers. And then the Quakers believed in both passive resistance 
uh, non pay uh, clergy, meaning you don't have to pay to go to church. Equality for women, that's big. We'll talk about women in a minute, that's huge. Um, also, simple meeting houses, okay? They were very democratic, uh, no military service, anti slavery, uh, no paid clergy, like I said, and then also no swearing oaths to the king. Um, they were the most successful colony of, and also one of the most diverse of all the 13. And of course, we know the city of Philadelphia or Philly is known as the city of brotherly love. And if you look at the history of it, we can kind of see why. All right, let's talk about the southern colonies now. Let's talk about Virginia, Maryland, the Carolinas, because the Carolinas was, before it was in North Carolina, South Carolina, there was just the Carolinas, and also Georgia. Um, you want to go ahead and talk about Maryland real quick for us, Ms. Garrity? Yeah, um, Maryland was a, a proprietary colony. Um, it was also a refuge for, um, for Catholics. Um, Catholics, um, in, in England particularly, were not, um, at this point in time, were not, um, they were not, like, they were kind of disliked. So Catholics kind of had an incentive to leave England and, and go to the New World. Um, and a lot of them settled in Maryland. Um, and you notice the, the name there, um, uh, Lord Baltimore, uh, who founded the, the colony, the, the major city in Maryland gets its name from, from him. Uh, they had a bicameral uh, legislature. And um, as you remember from your, your middle school government, um, bicameral means two, two houses. Um, so it was very sophisticated um, legislative body that they had developed. Um, but there were uh, problems in, in the colony. Um, so it was a haven for, for Roman Catholics, but you also had um, you know, Protestants. Um, and so they, tend to, they tended to clash. Um, in 1649, um, the Maryland Toleration Acts were drafted, and that allowed for freedom of worship for all Christians, trying to uh, kind of quell the, the discord between the two, um, the two denominations. Looking good. Okay, let's go ahead and finish this up, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so next up you have now going to be the Carolinas, which came start off as a... Um, Proprietary colony, and in 1729, it's split into two, okay? This right here is a pretty good graphic, a table, uh, to show you guys the colonies down here in the South who founded it, also the type of colony. Another good time to maybe do a screenshot to add this into your document, okay? <coughs> so South Carolina thought better than North Carolina. They had better harbors, they grew sugar, rice, and indigo. South Carolina also had by far the largest slave population in the whole new world. Only people they um, came second and third to was what's going on in Brazil and South America and also the West Indies. So no shock because they also grew a lot of sugar, rice, and indigo, which is very high need, high planted area. If you ever go down to South Carolina, you can grow anything there. Okay, now let's talk about Georgia, which is the, of course, we are the, because um, we live here in Georgia as far as this lesson, um, we are the neighbors to South Carolina. They started as a penal colony by James Oglethorpe. Remember, penal means jail, so you had a lot of uh, overcrowding in the jail system over in Europe, so they had to release some of that, so they brought them down here to Georgia. Georgia initially had nothing to do with slaves. It was literally just and over um, shoot for those people that's in jail and it's become overcrowded. So they had no um, form of religion as far as Catholicism, no slaves, no rum in the beginning. That changed as it started becoming more and more influenced by South Carolina and a lot of those inmates start become free because they got their freedom. Um, originally it was a haven for those who been jailed in England, like I said, because they couldn't pay their debts. So um, I'm not saying they were criminals in the sense they stole, they were criminals as far as they wasn't paying their debts, they was, they was in debt a lot, okay? So remember, don't ever get a lot of credit cards to get a debt, which is bad practice. Okay. All right, so elsewhere, I want to finish up with this right here is when we're talking about uh, Quebec. So established by Samuel de la Champion. It's a great location in, on the St. Lawrence River, good for trade and interior waterways and power, also great for fur, all right? This will be the capital of New France. So this is now up in Canada. You look here, look at the map. Uh, this is where you have like now, part of Michigan, Maine, and all New England. So this will be this area right above that, okay? Nova Scotia, things of that nature. 
All right, you guys, so that's going to be all for the first half. There's going to be some more videos that's going to come up for the second half. We're going to be talking about uh, more so what's going on with slavery, uh, solitary neglect, the function of the colonies. Then you have another video that's going to be talking about the, um, the events leading up to the uh, American Revolution, including the French Indian War. And that's going to be pretty much it for the unit. So we hope that this was helpful. I uh, hope you guys understand you can always pause the video anytime you feel you need to. Um, Ms. Garrett, anything you want to leave as far as final thoughts? Um, you can also replay the video if you need to. Um, that's how I, I learn best. I, I, I kind of don't take notes. I kind of sit back and absorb um, things um, if I'm first listening to a speaker or seeing something or reading something. And then give it another, another turn. Then just hit replay, go through it again, and um, jot down the things that, that have been emphasized, um, you know, as well as, you know, completing your, your closed notes. Um, you can never have too many notes. Yeah, you never can ask um, extra, it's good. And then, um, and then if you have questions, if things don't make sense, or you're, you know, you're having um, trouble making things kind of, kind of job, just write, write the questions down so that when we meet in class, you can um, give Dr. Tidwell and I the questions. So make sure you write those down. Don't, don't try to remember your questions. If something doesn't add up, jot it down in your notes. And then also remember to go look at the Unit 1 uh, Bitmoji Classroom. You have links there for both knowledge and status, but also a Cliff Notes guide, which gives you all this information, kind of a quick, easy way to do it. So remember, I'm not using a textbook, so I'm giving you guys a lot of material as far as this here. Also, your Cliff Notes, you have that. Um, you also have the flashcards that you can make and use that has even more compressed way of um, understanding material. And of course, in class, we're reviewing the material as far as using the Nearpods, vocabulary, and then different games we take in class. So make sure you guys ask questions as you need it, but our hope and prayers that you guys not only pass the class, but you have a better understanding of the place you live, which is the United States and also in the world. All right. So until next time, peace and blessings. See you guys back in the classroom.